Welcome to the Wald Culture Podcast. I'm Carla Nillington, and our Wald Culture guest today is Brewster Kale, a man who has profoundly influenced the development of the internet and web and how we look for and find information there. His foundation also generously supports the Wald Culture Project to explore these intersections between culture, technology, and copyright, and thank you for that, Brewster. Now, Brewster's Wikipedia entry gives a usefully concise introduction to the man, but one which, of course, contains multitudes, some of which we're going to explore shortly. It says, Brewster Lurton Kale is an American digital librarian, a computer engineer, an internet entrepreneur, an advocate of universal access to all knowledge. Kale founded the Internet Archive and Alexa, and in 2012, he was inducted into the Internet Hall of Fame. And as you'll see, you haven't exactly rested on those laurels in the past decade either. So welcome to the Wald Culture Podcast, Brewster. Thank you, Harley. This is, this is great to be here. Uh, People probably know you best today for the massive modern digital library, the Internet Archive, which just celebrated its 25th birthday, and perhaps in particular the joys of the Wayback Machine, a delightful Internet rabbit hole to explore, and I know has been useful, I think, in some court cases too, because it usefully preserves website pages in the past. Um, And so if people deny something, said something way back at some point. You have the evidence there inside the way back machine. So you're a friend to lawyers in that sense, I suppose, as well. Um, But you're an internet pioneer who's been recognized by the Internet Hall of Fame. And because of technologies that you helped develop, um, have gone on to become fundamental to organizing information on the internet from early on. And you developed the WAYS system, the first internet distributed research and document retrieval system, or search and document retrieval system, sorry, which was a critical precursor to the World Wide Web. And you, I, and, I, and indirectly, I would say you're responsible for an awful lot of people saying Alexa every day. And so uh, could you give listeners a little background on those technologies, what drove their development and maybe what happened with them? The idea for me, at least for the internet, was to try to build the great library. But before that, we had to actually get, well, publishing going. And the ways, um, which, you know, is not the ways that you use on your, uh, uh, for navigation, um, was uh, the first publishing system on the internet to try to help people have their voices heard, um, whether they were going to make money off of that or not. And it was the first publishing system. It, and it sort of merged into the World Wide Web with Mosaic uh, back in that, in that era. Um, but through that, we were able to get uh, the first publishers online, the first advertising-based um, uh, website, uh, CMP, I always incorporated, put online the first subscription-based um uh, uh, news service, which was the Wall Street Journal, um, Ways Incorporated put online. And so we, we got that going in the early 90s. Um, once that was going, um, then we could start to build the library. And Alexa Internet, uh, which was an uh, organization that crawled the World Wide Web and tried to catalog every website uh, on this burgeoning web uh, world, um, we started in 1996 and then sold to Amazon. So where, again, it's, it's not a, a direct uh, antecedent to the, uh, the talking assistant. Uh, I guess they use the name and Alexa Internet is still up and running as a, uh, as a company. Um, but the, once we got all of the sort of publishing going and search engines going, then we could build the library. And it was time to build the Internet Archive starting in 1996. Yeah, well, let's then tell us more about that then, because that and the Wayback Machine, um, what germinated that idea for this quite extraordinary next development? And it must have seemed from the beginning a very daunting project. The idea of, of building a library comes with every new publishing medium, right? I, at least for me, it was it was an obvious thing to do. Well, once we could get publishing going uh, in the digital realm, which, you know, trans, you know, we've, we've seen media types change a couple times before from oral to manuscript to manuscript to printing, um, we could build the library. And, and so this was always the point. 
Um, so once we got the the uh, the web kind of going um, and people really putting themselves in there, then the idea was to go and collect it all and then make really new and different, interesting magic services that you could do with that. Like, you know, search engines, but could you go further than that by data mining and helping people provide context to, for what they're looking at so that if it, it doesn't just uh, go at face value, um, could you go and make it so that it, it could help you filter things, provide context, uh, sift out the crap? And we've gotten a long way there, but not far enough. And we actually have some real problems on the Internet, both from a commercial business model's point of view, um, but also um, misinformation, disinformation, people that are, well, lying um, and paid to lie online. We don't have the technologies or the institutions um, that will uh, deal with this, and it's urgently needed. Yeah, let's, let's maybe um, look at some of the... Um, some of these issues that are there, because some of these are, they're huge issues. Um, I know maybe a, an, an interesting place to start, I think, is your um, perspective on the phenomenon of link rot, which is maybe something people don't think about in connection to copyright, but you've talked about it as um, a problem with a direct impact on the Internet Archive, um, some work you've done with Wikipedia, and that that link rot is in part generated because of the kinds of cultural bricks we're talking about on this um, in the Wald Culture Project. There's copyright, there's other government restrictions, there's paywalls. Can you talk a bit about what what is link rot and how how is it created? Had, um, how, how, what's the connection with the ways and the, these these aspects like copyright, like government, other government interventions, like paywalls? I, I'd say they're all sort of symptoms of the same kind of thing. I think it's interesting that in the early internet, we mostly talked about it as link rot, based on you know people putting up a web page, you link to it, and then um, your page that links to that other source, the the place disappears. Um, and that's either because it was taken down or was changed or became a parking site or whatever, just sort of just disappeared. And though that happens on every, uh, hundred days was the, the, the last study, uh, though other people are now studying wow. that again, uh, is the average life of a web page before it's taken down or deleted. But those are actually the good uh, era of the internet when, you know, it was just technological issues that we had, we had to overcome. But now people are putting up all sorts of other barriers um, to change content, to make it look different for different people. Um, just all sorts of um, things that are screwing around with how people perceive information that they're now turning to the internet to get. So we, um, the paywalls that have now sprung up, it seems on every news site, makes it so that as um, Current Affairs put it on their title of their issue, uh, lies are free, but the truth is paywalled. Um, that if we're going to bring up the next generation um, based on what they find online, we've got to put the best we have to offer within reach of our kids. Otherwise, they're just going to learn from whatever dreck they can get a hold of. And a lot of the dreck that's out there is paid for, promoted by somebody for some purpose. And we're now seeing state actors um, you know, or political parties going and doing um, you know, billion-dollar campaigns to go and change uh, uh, truth, um, to uh, go in and mold... Um, a generation based on free information where um, often the best information is either not online at all um, or if you put it online, they'll sue you. If you go and uh, make it available, um, uh, if you try to get news articles, then there's paywalls. And how many, you know, are you going to go to a small city newspaper and subscribe for a year to get one article? I think people are trying to figure it out, um, but it's not going great. Um, the advertising model is you know, obviously not great. Um, it, it ends up with perverse incentives, such as we have with Facebook and Twitter. Um, then we have paywalls, which is not great. Um, actually, the, the a business model that I like a lot are the libraries. 
libraries um, uh, in the United States are twelve billion dollar a year industry, and as I, I understand it, three to four billion dollars goes to publishers' products. This is an old statistic from a couple decades ago, so it's probably much more than that. It's maybe twenty percent of the whole trade. Uh, book industry. And that is, in some sense, a distributed, socialized support system for core literature. It's often the thing that sort of keeps a lot of publishers uh, alive is library spending. Of course, you know, as we know, um, library uh, publishers are now suing libraries and they're licensing things and that we'll maybe go into that in a bit but it uh we've um we, we've got some problems out there uh on the open internet now that we have people that have turned to their screens to try to answer questions understand their world um and we've got to figure out how to get rid of the poison yeah it's a huge huge set of problems across the um so many aspects of the internet right now. Um, and yeah, let's dive it more into some of those issues as we go along. Um, a, a good place to start is copyright. Uh, obviously with the internet archive and with the Wayback Machine, you're dealing with copies, millions upon millions of copies of materials from websites to audio to film. TV programs, software to books. If people haven't visited the Internet Archive, go and just you'll be amazed by the, the huge array of content that's there. But how have you approached this quite controversial issue of copyright? We're a library, so we just do what libraries have always done. We purchase materials or if they're available for free, we collect them, we preserve them and we lend them. Um, so we're not uh, republishing materials. We're uh, a library. And so this um, works well for the World Wide Web. We crawl web pages um, and, and archive them and make them available um, to people with a banner saying that it's not you know, the original website. It's from this particular time. Um, if there are particular web pages that are sort of um, that some individual, you know, their blog, they don't want up anymore, then we'll take them out of the Wayback uh, Machine. But we, uh, in general, just keep the whole thing whole and people uh, can go and see the web as it was. Um, it's too bad that this is required, but the web technology is so simple that they didn't build in any of the sort of way that publishing has always worked, which is usually a publisher puts something out and it goes into a bunch of different libraries such that if any of those go down, then you have um, the other copies. Um, but that's not how the World Wide Web works. There's only one copy and it's in one server. And if that goes and changes um, or goes down, then it's not available at all. So the web, that, that's been going along fine. Then we started archiving television. Um, mostly television news, and we made that available searchably. Um, actually, starting in 2001, right after the September 11th events, um, to try to help people understand um, what did the world see out of the September 11th, uh, and sort of how did that evolve. Um, and then we've just been digitizing books um, and made those available to the blind and dyslexic. Um, and that's been great for uh, accessibility um, and then uh, also for interlibrary loan and machine learning and controlled digital lending. So basically going and preserving these, purchasing these materials, acquiring them maybe through donation, um, then preserve them and then lend them. Uh, and help people uh, make sense of it. One cool thing was as actually we've gone and linked things into Wikipedia. So Wikipedia had lots of links out to the uh, to the live web. A lot of those uh, those web pages are gone, dead, or they or they go to um, periodicals, newspapers, or journal literature, or books. And so we um, working with the Wikipedia communities. Um, and there's lots of them, one for every uh, uh, language. Um, we have um, got a robot that runs over the, um, uh, the links and goes and tries to find which ones are dead. If they're dead, then we go and replace them with a link into the Wayback Machine. We've fixed over 10 million broken links um, that those links can now go into the Wayback Machine. Um, and also now uh, there's 1 million links to books that now go to about 300,000 different 
books. And what people do is they just do it for fact checking. They basically click and they go to go and understand a little bit more about it. And most, most people are sort of in and out of these either web pages or books or, or articles in, you know, 30 seconds or a minute. Um, but it makes it available so that the idea that you can actually click and see things can make it so that you can check up on that Wikipedia contributor. Does that actually support that uh, information? Or if you want to find out a bit more about that subject. One thing that you and Jonathan Zittrain recently spoke uh, about this quite curious link rot problem of um, of these, or not so much link rot, the changing page problem of um, for in, in this uh, context of Supreme Court cases where Supreme Court judgments placed online link to the um, evidence that was used by the justices to come to a decision, and yet those the content may change, which means then someone later on comes, maybe a, a, a law student, maybe um, any a, a person with a particular interest in a case, and what they read is not what the judge the justice put into the original case. Absolutely. That's, yeah, that's, no, isn't that scary? It's a fascinating area because it's something that I, I think you'd never think about. You just think it's there forever. But as you're saying, these links don't necessarily refer back to what was there when they were initially made, and some of them then disappear yeah. completely. But publishers come and go, right? Or they get merged or delete things. Everything goes out of print. You know, they just People are they're, they're looking to do the next thing. That's the right thing for them to do. That's why we have libraries. So libraries go and, and make uh, copies of these materials into their collections, um, digital world or in the physical world. We just bought the physical things and then had them in our uh, collections. And then uh, we can make them reliably available. And so I, I think the Jonathan Zittrain uh, study said 25% of the, the links out of the Supreme Court um, are not on the live web anymore. Out of the New York Times, that's the same kind of numbers. Those, hmm. those resources are just not there, or maybe even more of them are uh, have been changed. Um, so we need a, a, a we, we can't build a culture on shifting sands. We need to have solid, reliable versions of what happened. Um, and let publishers and, and, you know, blog writers and tweeters go and work on the next thing. Um, but we libraries are funded to try to help that um, uh, fix that problem. And so it's, uh, it, it is, it's, it's fascinating to see, you know, people starting to realize like, oh, my God, we're depending on this yet. Um, it's shifting all the time. The Internet Archive collects hundreds of millions of pages every day um, to try to get ahead of this because uh, we never know what's going to be needed. You've encountered a lot of pushback from publishers, from copyright holders with the Internet Archive. Not all, but but with some. Um, can Let's talk a bit about that, perhaps, because I wonder... Is, is any particular area of material that's held on the archive um, more contentious than the others? And um, and what what is the problem with, or is there a problem with industries understanding the concept of a digital library as opposed to a bricks and mortar library and the role those libraries have with print materials? Uh, the Internet Archive has been around for 25 years, um, and we've been moving along and getting, you know, working with these different publishing entities and um, and getting things, you know, moving. And, you know, that's not to count the, uh, well, I guess, decade and a half that I spent before that working with publishers directly to get them online to sort of understand what this Internet thing is, how they can play a role, what are, how this whole thing is going to uh, un unfold. Um, so it's, it's been working out fine. Um, and we started doing this digitizing and lending of books in 2011. Um, it's been going on for a long time by, uh, many, many, many libraries going in, uh, going and digitizing materials from their collections and making them available. Um, uh, 80, I think, uh, directly. And then, uh, with the pandemic, it's now in the hundreds. So this, uh, idea of, of, Controlled digital lending, where one goes and 
digitizes and then makes them available one time, one person at a time using the same protections that the publishers use for their in print works, you know, for our dusty musties so that you can get the out of print 20th century type materials to people, one uh, reader at a time in a controlled way um, using those DRM things. It's been going on for 10 years. Um, but during the pandemic, um, there are uh, four large, very, very large now, um, uh, uh, the biggest of the commercial publishers, the conglomerates, decided to sue the Internet Archive to try to get the Internet Archive to stop lending uh, books to kids uh, and parents that are locked out of their libraries. Um, and again, it's one at a time. Um, and so uh, this is... Um, yeah, problematic. Um, basically, things have been moving along fine for 25 years and 10 years just in this particular uh, corner of uh, uh, approach. And uh, I guess ba- the pandemic uh, has caused some bad behavior. Because you wanted to, you wanted to be able to make available multiple copies rather than the single check-in and check-out version for for people who now couldn't access libraries any longer because we were all in lockdown all across the world this this was um so there was a variation then on what you would have traditionally so there was a doing, variation which was the single this. was the single um uh, can you maybe can you explain to people who don't know how that might work how does somebody come to you borrow something and then return it and then what what happened that was different during the pandemic yeah. So uh, the, if you go to archive.org or an even easier one is openlibrary.org, you can go create a free library card. Um, and then uh, if there's a book that you uh, want to read uh, more than a page or two of, you can see a, you know, a few pages, which actually is plenty for most people. And then if you want a few more pages, then you, you click um, to borrow it. And if nobody else is borrowing it, then you are and you alone uh, get to read it for an hour or uh, up to 14 days. And then it's automatically returned. There's no late fees, which is kind of nice. <laughs> um, then the... Uh, that book is, is you can turn the pages um, and people usually look at a few pages and then either return it or kind of forget about it. And it just runs out the uh, out the time. So that's how, how it works. And if we have um, uh, if there's other libraries that have copies that they have put aside for this purpose, then the Internet Archive lends that uh, copy as well. So there might be more than one copy, but there's usually only a few uh, of these uh, uh, copies of books that are made available through this lending way in controlled uh, digital lending. When the pandemic hit and um, on Friday, um, there's the Americans got... Uh, uh, sent home from schools and they were told they're not coming back. So, and teachers panicked. I was like, how are they going to get their schoolwork done come Monday? And so we started getting panicked calls from people as to what it is that should happen here. And so we asked libraries if they would sign on to an, an emergency measure that would run for 14 weeks, um, to go and make uh, these books available um, more than the counts that we have, but would be less than the counts that they have. Um, and we got 100 libraries that went and signed up. And these libraries basically said, yes, we support um, what it is uh, you're doing. Our libraries are closed during this period. Um, then we have books that um we think should be lent to uh, to people digitally. So we um, exceeded the number in some circumstances, not many, um, of the, the number of books that the Internet Archive um, owns and the libraries that have more explicitly signed up to do this temporary emergency um, library to go and uh, take down the, uh, the wait lists. And so it worked. Um, and it, you know, it was to run for 14 uh, weeks and the publishers sued. Um, and they sued really not so much based on National Emergency Library. It's just lending at all. And they sued about 127 books 
That was the their their and the, what their demand is is because there's these 127 books. They want us to destroy 1.3 million digital books. So they are it's outrageous. Um, so they, they say there's 127 which we took down right away. And, and if any authors went and told us to take things down, we just took them down. Um, and we took those down, uh, right, right away. But there were, you know, popular readers that, you know, the Lord of the Flies, you know, things that, you know, kids actually could really use. But I guess the heirs, uh, anyway. Um, so the publisher sued about 20, 127 books, but they want us to destroy 1.3 million books. Be, and, um, and it's about lending in general. But um, so this program was to go for 14 weeks. We cut it short by two weeks, so it ran for 12 weeks. Um, but the lawsuit continues, and it'll continue for years and cost millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> which which seems to be better spent on other things, perhaps. But there we are in the modern oh, yeah. co I mean, it, copyright age. I mean, if you're a billion-dollar corporations, which these, these guys are, you know, they, they sue libraries all the time. Um, so, um, but libraries just, you know, don't have a big bucket of money to go and, uh, defend against billion dollar company lawsuits. Um, mm -hmm. but that's what they, that's what they do. Um, and I think we, I think we end up, could end up with a much better situation. I think we had a perfectly fine situation where we had controlled digital lending running for 10 years. It's actually, it's, it's not even all that great for the readers, um, but we always follow what the publishers do in terms of controlling access um, to their imprint, you know, their Harry Potters. Um, so our Dusty Musties um, would be sort of as hard to use as they've made the, the, the imprint works. And we just follow their lead. Um, so I think that that works. And I'm hoping that the judge understands that this works um, and that you know, there's there's now hundreds of libraries doing it. Um, it's about the only way to take the materials that will never be done in ebooks, and And also even it's these books are used in a very different way. They're used much more like how you use in a library. You might go and pull things off, read a little bit, put it back on, you know, or you might stack it up and do little bits and pieces out for your report. You would never buy the book in those circumstances. And that's how we see most of the books being used, like as Wikipedia footnotes. We're the number one place people go now from Wikipedia, mostly the Wayback Machine, but now also to uh, other materials in the Internet Archive to dive deeper. But, you know, you're doing a report. You're going to go and use it and then put it back in the library shelf. That's And these books are valuable. They're wonderful. They should not be burned. They shouldn't be burned from a library based on library's law, uh, publisher's lawsuit. And you recently spoke to the Knight Foundation in the U.S. about what you described as the three battles, and I think we're picking up on the, the a bit of the third battle right here in this conversation. But you were talking about three phases of the Internet in which you've participated in the particular battles as we've gone along. Um you you noted that a lesson I have learned is that these battles are never won outright, but are reframed and refought decade after decade, which is a little discouraging as, as too. It's a sort of history repeating itself probably in a, a way we wish it, it wasn't. But can you talk a, just a little bit about those three battles and um, and bring us to the third? Yes. So I, I was asked by the Knight Foundation, what have you learned over these, uh, you know, your 40 years of being involved in the internet and, and in the evolution? And it's like, yeah, there's three battles that are going, uh, that, that I've seen and participated in. Um, the first one was about the plumbing of the internet. It was sort of AT&T versus the ARPANET and the and AT&T, um, versus the internet. And, um, we say, well, you know, of course it would have come come out as the internet. It's like, no, it really didn't look that way at the time. But it was really helped along by AT and T being the uh, monopoly being broken up um, in 1982. So that really helped. Um, so the government really, um, and you know, at that point we got things like answering machines and cell phones and the internet. And all sorts of things happened um, uh, when you sort of get rid of your monopoly. Um, and so um, that battle has 
raged. And then in the early 90s, there were 40,000 ISPs in the United States. How many are there now? I mean, how many choices do people have of, of what they hook up to? Maybe one, maybe two. Yeah. Um, and the tier one providers are now all sort of rolled back together. So there's just, there's not, you know, even at the backbone of the internet. And that's why it made it so easy for the NSA to spy on uh, what everybody was doing was there were so few places that just carried all the traffic. So, yeah, we're, we're having to rebattle that one. Number two was the protocols, right? It was, um, and it was the openness. And now this was the, um, World Wide Web versus AOL, right? Sort of how, how does that mm -hmm. sort of play out? <laughs> and also there's the free and open source software that Richard Stallman, uh, was a champion of and, and, and major motivator of. And that again, we kind of won that one. Right. Um, so it's not a walled garden. You could, anybody could set up their own website. There's search engines that made it so that you, there's lots of different players. There were lots of different search engines. And then there started to be fewer and fewer. And there's fewer search engines. And now we're kind of back to the walled garden kind of thing with Facebook, mm -hmm. which is kind of like AOL. Meta, meta, um, meta. So we're having to fight that one again. Um, the third one um, uh, is about the content layer, um, and that's uh, who's going to control um, what's out there. Um, and we're now seeing real aggregation uh, into very few places of whole media types. So you get the Spotify's that really control music, and the Netflix and a couple others um, control movies. Um, so this is not a distributed publishing platform in the sense that if you had an idea or you wanted to go and publish your friend's idea, you could go and put it up. You could make some money. Maybe you could distribute it for free. You have some mechanism of going and making things available. We have basically very, very few publishing platforms uh, now that are controlling home media types. Uh, and this is some of the uh, lack of antitrust um, uh, work that's going on in the part of the government to try to keep down the monopolies and the oligarchies. Um, so that's the, I'd say the current one. And um, even though the other ones are still being fought um, that are, will really determine I, if you're um, trying to understand who to, to, uh, to elect into the next, um, in the next election, is that information just controlled by a few companies as to exactly what it is you see? Um, that's kind of where we're going. So if we want some, a different future, if we want openness, we have to keep pushing, fighting, making it models work, keep the technology moving along. So we have a game with many winners, not just a few. If we only have a few organizations, a few big corporations, a few large governments determining what it is you see, we all lose. So we need a mechanism that without permission, you can set up a new enterprise and get some distribution so that we don't go and lock it all down. That was the world basically that I grew up with. And we were really trying to get the internet to be something different. And it is different. We're still a people's internet. I'm still hopeful, but boy, do we have to work on it and go and try to make an internet that has many winners. Um, commercial winners, distribution winners, lots of different voices that um, we have um, uh, an open system. Um, mm. It's what that's how capitalism is supposed to work. But we now have licensing structures and monopoly and oligarchy that is um, not working well for most people. Let's just, um, as we be approach the end of this podcast, I'd like to touch on a couple of those areas. One, looking ahead, how would you like to see copyright evolve then to make knowledge storage and sharing easier and more widespread? Um, well, copyright has actually been sort of twisted into these life plus 50, life plus 70. I mean, why do you need to um, give extra incentive to dead authors? I, it's it, it's nuts. It has just um, been warped around by these large corporations and their lobbyists. So that's not good. But they've even gone further and they say, well, copyright isn't enough for us. We need to have everything licensed. License means that you can't even hold on to things, at least with a book back in the old days. Um, you could go and buy it and own it forever and you could, you know, give it to somebody else. You could lend it. You could, uh, have it and, uh, pass it down to your kids. 
That's not what happens anymore. This uh, in the ebook world, they're saying the basic functions of how libraries work, which is they buy things, preserve them, and lend them. You're not allowed to do any of those. You're not allowed to buy something such that you actually own it. It's a license that they can pull back at any time, and it's fixed to a platform, so you can't even go and make it work on the next generation of technology. So it's, you know it's largely got a uh, an end of life whatever that file format is or that device or whatever mm -hmm. as the maximum. Uh, you're not allowed to preserve things um, uh, and, and move them forward, and you're not allowed to lend. So copyright wasn't even enough for them. And so what do we do? Um, well, certainly let's um, work on it in many different ways. The market, let's go and buy things, really buy things that support the few and it's mostly the indie publishers because they're getting screwed by the big boys too um they're they're the only ones that are going and selling ebooks um support them and libraries should support them um law structures that we have to uh go and um we have to get better at communicating this uh issue to legislatures that would, i think have no idea how bad it's gotten um and how how often it's hurting uh, of people. We need better technologies for dis distributed and decentralized technologies so that materials live in many places. Um, and we have to just uh, re restore the norms um, of how we are assuming our technologies are supposed to work and not throw out hundreds of years of the tradition of libraries or personal ownership of our own uh, materials, you know, things that we've read. Um, movies that we've seen, records that we've played. Can we go and make it so that we have that norm of, yeah, that's important enough to be in my collection and make that possible as opposed to make everything a kind of rental leasing model where you own nothing. Well, you right now you've got a rather wry look ahead at where we might end up with the um, way forward machine um, on the archive.org website. And I'd certainly encourage people to go explore that. Um, can you maybe explain what that is and, um, and how optimistic are you then about the future? If you're, if you're pitching the idea of the way forward machine, um, you, you can go there and enter, um, say, google.com and, and find out some interesting views of how our future might oh, look. Yeah, we, we basically took some of the, you know, that black mirror approach, which is let's take way things, you know, there are trends that are going in this direction and then run it out of it further and go and say, what happens if really the surveillance capitalism, everything you're looking at is watched? What if you can go and, and you can now with the technologies go and say, oh, you're in that country, you're in that city, you're that color, you're that, um, uh, that income group. We're going to show you something completely different. Um, we're, we, or you're not going to get access to it. That's already happening. So we have um, publishers not selling or not even licensing their uh, ebooks to libraries because – they just don't care about the people that use libraries um, getting access to books. Um, so for no, uh, no, there's no amount of money that the uh, libraries could go and license so that um, the, the hundreds of millions of people. So this sort of thing is happening. And we just sort of drew it out further of what happens. And then what do you do about it um, if things go that bad? And, you know, things start going underground. Um, and that's not how you run a culture, right? That's not how a, a free and open people learn and develop. But it, it could happen. So we just thought we'd shine a light on that and say, look, let's not have that happen. It's up to us. We are the people that are still in control of this. We can still new do to new technologies. The decentralized web is very interesting. It's going to have all sorts of interesting characteristics to it. Let's keep the evolution going. Let's go and get academic uh, materials that are paid for by the government. Let's get those in uh, open access. Right? There, there's no real reason why they shouldn't be, yet this just clamped down. Um, how do we go and make an internet it lives up to the dream of what we wanted out of the internet and not just let a few very, very large and ever growing because of these ac uh, acquisitions um, happen. 
Am I encouraged? Yes. Like the Department of Justice just sued to try to um, stop a merger of two major book publishers. So that we'd go from five publishers down to four major ones. Um, that's encouraging. Uh, we only see that happen uh, during some administrations in the United States um, <laughs> to go and actually see antitrust um, help uh, um, serve people. Um, so we would like to see more of that. Are, am I am I optimistic? Yes, I'm still hopeful that we still have the controls to go and make new and different, and better technologies, laws, norms, markets work better. I'm encouraged by people like Brickhouse that are finding new models that get their books out there in new and different ways. Let's get people paid, but let's also serve the broader public interest. Great. And finally, your hopes for the next the next 25 years of the Internet Archive. Um, it's time to build a library that's that's actually interesting and helps people with their day to day issues. How do you figure out with misinformation, uh, disinformation, um, provide context, sense making? So I think we can have libraries play a neutral position, um, but an active um, position to help people understand what's going on out there. So where the Wayback Machine and the Internet Archive is, you know, basically a large repository, kind of hard to use. If you use archive.org, please try uh, and, and use it. It's still useful. It's, I don't know, the number 300th most popular website out there. So that's good. Um, but there's so much more that we can do to go and um, uh, help people make sense of their world that's now more and more digital and more and more confusing. That's, mm -hmm. I think, the role of the libraries and the role of the Internet in general. Great. Uh, and I fully agree, Brewster Kale. Thanks so much for talking to us today on um, Walled Culture. And for anyone who wants to learn more about what we've discussed today, be sure to visit archive.org as a starting place. Try the Way Back and the Way Forward machines and check out the great collection of material in the anniversary celebration section of the website as well. You can also follow the Internet Archive and you can follow Brewster on Twitter too. And to our listeners and viewers, thank you so much for joining us today. For now, it's goodbye from me, Carlin Lillington, and the Bald Culture Podcast. And we hope that you'll join us for future episodes ahead as we explore the spaces where technology, culture, and copyright collide. Goodbye. Goodbye.